Uh, but today, we're going to hear from Dr. Lee Tang from Iowa State University. Uh, and he's going to be talking about some of his work, uh, in particular, the, uh, the idea of plant recognition for robotic weeding. Uh, that's one of the things that our first speaker talked about. Uh, but Dr. Tang is going to probably go into some more detail. Uh, he's in the Biological Systems Engineering Department at Iowa State. Uh, so he traveled over here last night, and uh, I'm going to just turn the floor over to him. He can tell you a little bit more about what he's been doing, some of his research and teaching responsibilities, uh, and then at the end, um, uh, we will actually have a question and answer session. So I need to also make that note. Uh, we'll, we'll have an hour of, of the seminar, but uh, if you can, and you're more than welcome to stay, uh, there'll be probably 20 minutes or so for uh, for question and answer. So uh, just be aware that we're we're going to go beyond just the normal hour. So uh, with any without any more delay, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dr. Tang. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, so first of all, um, I really appreciate appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, yeah, I think it's an honor for me to have a chance to share my research experience with you and also for the folks online. Um, so as Steve already introduced, um, you know, basically my background, I'm, I'm working at Iowa State University right now in um, the Department of Agriculture and Biosystem Engineering. And a little bit about my bio. Um, so I had my BS from elect Electrical Engineering and both MS and a PhD from Agricultural Engineering. Um, so I did my PhD in University, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And I worked five years in Europe in total, and then, yeah, this is my ninth year uh, in, at Iowa State University. Um, <clears throat> my research is really uh, pretty much focusing on agricultural automation and the robotics. Um, so today, um, this topic, as I told Steve, yeah, this is really my favorite topic because that really ties to my research, many years of my research. Um, so this robotic weighting is the subject I've been really kind of wrestling with for <laughs> more than a decade, and I tried various, various ways to try to make this impossible. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it's nice to have this opportunity to come here and then to share with you folks about what I have been doing, and then also to see your feedback. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to develop my speech around robotic weighting. And then basically kind of tie that to the sensing part. So what would be the required to have a sensing system that would enable this technology? So to do that, the first part I want to talk about here is the robotic weighting. Um, so robotic weighting, basically you can tell it's by using robot to control weight. And so I have some kind of slides there. Um, um, this is the system I worked when I was a graduate student at, uh, at the University of Illinois, and that's called a smart sprayer. And it's doing uh, selective spraying based on where the weights are. And if there, there is no weight, we don't spray. And this is another conceptual design uh, of using a small spatter type of robot to take care of the vegetable plantation. And this is another picture showing uh, former uh, CSO Research Institute, what they did in uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure, sugar beet field maybe, for weight control by using robots. Okay, so just some examples. Then I have some more examples there. It's a mixture of different types of technology. And you see human operators, you can see human robots there. Um, they are using their hands and the fingers to pull the weights. And you can see these very kind of primitive kind of tools where you still use them very commonly. And, um, then we gradually move on to some more mechanized approach, and then eventually some more robotic type of approach, as you can tell on the screen. Um, so all those systems do require some kind of recognition function. Either that function can be realized by our human eyes, which we do by hands, then, or by, um, by a kind of uh, system either um, vision-based system or other type of sensor-based system to recognize what it can do, what, where, the target, where is the target. And 
So there are some other more pictures and to give you a little bit more reference about, you know, you can find those uh, report work in literature about uh, different type of systems. Um, so what I want to draw your attention here is to look at some of the kind of features about those different type of systems. And this is really kind of, we call it the state of the art. It's called the RoboCrop and it's commercially available and it's doing, um, we call it in row mechanical weed control, primarily for vegetable crops. And so one thing we probably, there's a couple of features I think I, we, we probably want to pay attention. First, it, it has a kind of, they call a cutout disc that stays in the crop row. And then when the system detects, basically there is a camera here in front, detects the crop stand, then the disc is going to rotate. So it would allow that cutout area to match with the crop. So it won't damage the crop. So you kind of circumvent the crop while staying in the crop row. It's a very clever design, but we do understand there are some, I think, limitations about what this machine can accommodate for different plantation situations. Um, it requires relatively larger interplant spacing to work with. And, um, and also, I don't think that machine is designed for seeded crops. It's more for transplant type of crops, which uh, have larger interplant spacing. And there are some other uh, type of mechanisms used for primarily for what we call the inner row weight control. Between the row, we have lots of ways to control them, the weights. We can have cultivator that can easily mechanically control weights between the rows. But those ones in the row, that's, those are the ones we, we know they are difficult to reach because you don't want to damage your crop. Um, So I think without going into the details about each of the design, what kind of features we need to realize, realize is um, they are all trying to um, get a job done on also in a way to balance what are the requirements to the system system and what, can, what are the function, the complexity of the functionality of their mechanical system. Um, for example, if you look at the robot crop, even though it's the state of art right now, but it's doing that kind of linear motion. So that really requires the tractor or platform to move quite precisely along the crop row. So you, don't, you cannot drive a little bit off set from your crop row because that would potentially damage your crop. So then there are kind of extra requirements put on top of the system to make the operation um, you know, satisfactory. Um, But somehow that reduced the burden of the sensing system because then your sensing system would only need to know, okay, from this crop to that crop stand, what's the distance and to the next. So you're basically doing a more or less like a, like a linear one dimensional detection of the crop plants. <coughs> so um, after really kind of have read, read, read through uh, lots of literature and also uh, after some years of uh, thinking about what would be the ideal, um, for example, mechanical intro waiting robot. What are the features I would think I would, would like to have for this type of robot to work? And so I kind of summarized there and then I'm sharing them with you right now here. So first I think the weights are are controlled with minimal energy input while maintaining a, a satisfactory work rate. So the energy consumption, I think, is there. And um, do we really have to use very heavy duty, high power, high horsepower machinery, machinery there to control weight? Um, yeah, that's something we need, we need to debate. Not always the situation which would require that kind of heavy and high horsepower machinery. And we need to minimize the crop damage. And that's, yeah, that's no brainer. It has to be there. You cannot, cannot mess up your crop while controlling weeds. And then the operator error and the fatigue and the constraints need to be removed by autonomous operations. So ideally, we, we would like to, to have the machine run fully autonomously. You don't have to use any operator. 
and also lightweight. So that would really allow a larger time window for the machine to get into the field because lighter weight would offer increased field mobility to your machinery. Uh, often we miss, we miss the time, the, the prime time to get into the field. Then later on we found after a couple of weeks, the weights just grow very big. And we think, oh yeah, I wish we would get in there in time. But so when you have very heavy piece of equipment, you have to consider the soil condition very seriously. Okay. <clears throat> And the system should be capable of operating in a large variety of transplanted and seeded crops. So we want to come up with a solution which is more universal. Uh, I think a robot crop is not designed or is not meant for seeded crops. Okay, but we do have a large number of crops that are seeded. Okay? And or even some of the transplanted crops, they are now necessary even in spaced or with larger you know, interplant spacing. And also the system has to be adaptive to crop and weed growth stages. That's a challenge. So they grow, they change their shape, they change their feature. And the cost. So very much when you have the technology there and then whether the farmers would adapt to your technology, the cost is certainly there, a big factor there for them to make decision. So we have to justify the technology can be competitive with other weed control strategies. So those are the seven features I think would um, make up a good or ideal weeding robot. So I want to kind of go this uh, along this go along this path a little further, and that would lead to the, our current effort in terms of de developing such kind of robot. And the example I want to give here is this called the Eco Wheeler. It's um, commercially available. It's um, manually operated. So it's a tractor pulled, but then with a human operator, manually operated um, wheeler. It's a uh, control weights in the crop row. And as you can tell from the picture, how it operates. So you, the human operator look at the crop row, and then with two arms holding the handles, and then you do that in and out. Uh, motion to control the, in this case, uh, spinning times in and out to control weights between the crop stands. It's a, I, I personally, I tried this machine. It, it's not that hard to move them because you have a very uh, nice here extended lever effect there so that you don't need to use lots of force. I think the problem comes with when you use this for a long time, then you get really uh, tired. And, and also this kind of highly concentrated type of work, you need to look at the crop row. Uh, yeah, you cannot <laughs> doze off, you know, you have to be careful. Um, I, I'm not sure how I can run the video. Just want to show you this video on the internet, so you can it's it's available publicly there, and just show you the operation. They can have multiple units, and they arrange them in a row, so you can control multiple rows with multiple operators. And well, in in some ways, I really like this system. It's simple. Okay, when you look at the system, yeah, it's simple, and uh, it's quite effective, especially that that spinning. Um, Tine brush. That, that thing has a very effective weed control um, effects. It has weed uprooting. It also has the cutting effects. So it, it's very effective. Um, as you can tell, it depends on the, how seriously the operator is, man is, is moving the arms. So you can have very precise control uh, of weeds in the crop roll. So in my research lab, we have been trying to develop a machine, but not really by using a human operator to move the, you know, the tool, but by using robot. 
And uh, we actually have gone through several versions of the design. And just really by coincidence, we didn't know the equalizer really, in, as a matter of fact. But we came up with kind of idea very similar to equalizer at the end. <laughs> um, because we want to use that spinning action, we know it has very good weight control effectiveness, and also that would reduce the traction requirement of your vehicle because it's really doing the, it's breaking the ground by the spinning action, not by the like plowing, plowing this shear force action. Um, that would probably make that tool very ideal for small vehicle like a small robot. And the challenge comes to how you can uh, realize that you kind of lever effect so you can reduce the torque requirement for that spinning, the pivoting arm, like our human arm who is, who, uh, who is used to operate that lever. So we, we came up with this design and it has some advantages in first reducing the torque requirement of the actuator, which is the electric motor here. We used the belt uh, transmission here and then so the actual force is um, implemented here at the far end and then we have this, uh, this uh, <coughs> arc gear. So, so that would allow us to move this arm left and the right with everything like heavy pieces of motor gear parts that are all in the center of the rotation. So which means you don't carry heavy piece of components and on speed. So you reduce the inertia of the mechanism, then that would allow you to have better dynamic control or fast actuation speed. So we want to move everything which are heavy into the rotation center. So then you don't swing anything heavy. So that would reduce the inertia. And then we, in our design, we envision there will be multiple sensors in front for crop road detection and also for the dynamic sensing of the vehicle and also for the detection of crop plants and weeds. So we have multiple cameras there to provide the information which is needed by the robot. And we had our first trial um, of our very first platform, just single pivoting arm version, but we want to see if how, how easily we can use one motor to swing this spin uh, tiny brush. Oops. I have to come. Um, we didn't really go into the into the refined fabrication, and you know, we we purchased this uh, tying component from Equator, and then we just put it onto our pro prototype. So you can see it can move left and right. We basically can swing that in and out. Is the head itself spinning there? It looks like it's turning yeah. at a maybe. It's it's rotating. spinning, yeah, by itself. There is a motor to spin it. But, but is it, it looks like it's spinning only like one or two RPM. Is it spinning faster than that? Oh, it's faster than that. It's about 400 RPM or something like that. Yeah. And then we later on have a developed two pivoting arm version. And this is um, our kind of latest design to show, this is to show you the caddy design with animation. So this would uh, basically kind of realize that operator's function, if you recall the equator. Um, and another thing we need to notice is this would give you the capability. So in case your robot is drifting off the center line of the crop row, and that pivoting arm does have the degree of freedom to accommodate that offset. So which means you, it's tolerant to certain level of traction error along the crop row. So each arm, pivoting arm is independently controlled. So we have already have a pattern um, 
uh, disclosed. <coughs> so you can accelerate the de accelerate and then you move them independently. And that's our kind of uh, illustration of a small buggy type of uh, wheeler in, um, with two spinning times. So then that kind of links to the major topics of my presentation to the, the sensing system. So to allow this type of robot to work, we need to have an information map like this. So the robot has to know where to go, where to drive the tools without damaging crop. So primarily, if we are focusing on mechanical weeding, we need to know where are the crop stands. And then we need to define something we call crop damage risk zone. So don't let your tool get in that small room, which is too close to the rooting area of your crop stand. So we try to stay away from that, we call it a dangerous zone. And we can see there are some variations about their location. They are not exactly on collinear, they are not exactly on the same line. So if you want to go to kind of higher level of precision, we ideally would like to know for each crop stand where they are. So then we can develop some kind of, we call it operational trajectory that would accommodate each individual crop stand. So can you imagine you have this, we, I call it weed terminator, with two spinning tines straddling this crop row, but that would just come in and out automatically to accommodate each individual corn plant like this. So that's my vision. So that's a very small machine. They may not be able to do multiple rows you know, or fully autonomous fashion, but if you think of the key components, the detection system, and then that dual arm, pivoting arm structure, it can be multiple, um, it can be um, expanded into multiple units. So you can take care of multiple rows as well. If, for example, you use a tractor as the, the pulling uh, platform, okay? Those are the pictures, they are really kind of, <laughs> Shocking when you look at them because we took them in an um, experimental field. We intentionally didn't do any weed control, okay? And as you can tell, the weeds can grow like this. They are just competing with your crop. And then, uh, in case we missed um, the prime time to get in the field and you still want to control weeds under this kind of we call the worst scenario, then we need to know where are crops and where are the weeds, right? So then I'm going to kind of list some of the um, some, some of the criteria that a system system has to um, has to meet so first which is which which is crop which is, which is wheat and where is it so how fast can you detect you cannot take minutes there to think because that this thing is moving so you have to make decision on the go and how difficult to know, which means how, what kind of sensor you have to put there. Don't make your system too, too pricey, okay? Um, or how much ca calculation you have to do to get the solution. And then which one should we focus on? Should we focus on crop? Should we focus on weight? Or should we focus on both? So that's what's the best way to do this. So I'm trying to um, show you some of the projects I have, uh, my group has worked through the years, and show you different um, aspects of different sensing approaches. And then from those examples, you can tell um, correspondingly what kind of weighting technology we may pair up with different sensing technology. Um, so that's basically what, what am I going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to introduce four different type of um, sensing systems we have worked through through the years. And this, all, most of those systems, they have tie to this, we call it interplant spacing um, system. So I 
was involved in developing multiple versions of this we call the corn plant interplant corn plant interplant space and measurement system. So an industrial sponsor, they would like to automate that process so they can acquire the interplant spacing data automatically without using the tape mayor. <clears throat> so those are the four different um, systems I would like to introduce to you briefly and then kind of give you some highlights about my thoughts. And the, the first system we use laser proximity sensors and they are kind of more simpler than the rest of the three systems. And the other three systems are all computer vision based. The second one is two-dimensional counter uh, vision system and then the third one is stereo vision system based and then last one is the time of flight of light based 3D sensing. So, so this is the first one. Uh, it has its simplicity and basically you use a laser range finder and actually it's just the on and off switch type of uh, proximity sensor. So when that laser beam is triggering by, is reflected by an object, then you get on you get a signal change from there is no object. So once you have that sensor going along your crop row, then as you can imagine, if you um, couple, the, couple the laser signal with the distance signal, then you have a map, okay? And then if we stack, for example, in this case, we have four of them together vertically, then you scan them along the crop row, then we would create this we call the crop row profile but only four dots, okay, each vertical line. So, but if you're doing that at kind of certainly certain high frequency, then you could create quite um, um, kind of insightful profile about the crop stands along the crop row. So then really the intelligence comes from the algorithm. So we need to develop a very kind of clever algorithm that would be able to extract the crop stand location from this very sparse data type of uh, crop, crop row profile. So that's the challenge. You don't have a rich set of data. Your resolution, the data resolution is low. And we had some experiments in the field with like one, two, three, four sensors on each side. And then we pull this sensor platform between the crop rows. And as you can tell from here, it can also operate in the evening. Um, so you see the laser dots on the screen here. So they, they work under any lighting condition. Lighting condition doesn't really matter at all. So at the end, you would uh, obtain this type of uh, profile and then we wrote our algorithms to try to decipher this kind of <laughs> looks very messy type of profile because you see lots of just some dots and then they are not with good resolution. <clears throat> but we have obtained very promising results in just uh, in terms of finding the crop stands and then also getting the spacing. So there are a couple of examples I show you with different, um, so you see the, on top you see the color picture and then at the bottom you see the sensor outputs. And then also the vertical lines represent our finding of where the corn plant stem is. And those are the data we collected and it's, as you can tell, we have um, accuracy ranging from 95% to 100%. And most of the times we are reaching pretty much above 98% of accuracy. And this technology actually is further developed right now. And um, I think some people, especially the people in breeding industry would like to use this type of technology to collect field data. So this system, by using laser proximity sensor switches, 
they, they are simple. They don't care about lighting condition. So, and, um, so the, the reliability is there because of the sensor we use. So the drawback is um, it's only give you one dimensional actually information. So from this crop to next crop, what's the distance? Right. So you cannot really do something we call the trajectory planning. So you really go around each crop stand precisely. So what we can do is we can get in and get out. Get into the gap, get out from the gap. So that's basically what we could do if we want to use this type of sensing system to control weeds in the crop row. And you could certainly improve the system by coupling some other sensors like vision sensor together with this type of uh, uh, laser proximity switch sensor array. So the second um, system I want to introduce here is the very much conventional two-dimensional color image processing based. And here what we are still similar application, we want to find corn plants where they are and also do the measurement to get the space in between two plants in a row. Okay. Um, so the first one, we use the camcorder, and the second one, we use a digital camera. But they are basically both the same type of signal, two-dimensional color images. So once we obtain the images, the two-dimensional color images, to recover the spatial information of the crop in the, in the crop row, the first thing we did is called the real-time mosaicing. And it's, it's basically to reconstruct the crop row uh, picture as one really kind of stretched single image by using real-time mosaic and technique. So you could have a, picture, have, have a picture like this that would represent maybe one mile, one mile long of crop row. I think Simon, when he was introducing some his thoughts, he used this uh, as an example. Because that essentially gave you a very nice, we call the crop row map, which you can put into your computer system on board of a robot. And so in case then if we know each crop where they are in this picture, essentially we can guide our tools, either a mechanical weighting tool or you know, maybe chemical or pesticide spraying tool. So any type of tool we want to have a precise actuation, then we can utilize this uh, crop row image. And those are some examples generated by the, this sequential uh, stitching operation we call the mosaicing. Then once you have this image, which is a mosaic crop row image, and then the next step is to identify where are the crops and also to identify where is the center of the stem location. So then we went through the process or image process and first is really to the color transform. So to segment vegetation from soil background under natural um, outdoor lighting condition is nothing really trivial. It, it's a very challenging topic, and still we are wrestling with that, ta that, that task to have reliable segmentation under natural lighting condition. So what we did, we transformed this into this color space called extent, excessive green and the RB um, diagonal direction. So there are two axes, and then, so after this transformation, we do the clustering by using K-means clustering method. And then further, we train these um, cluster images by using the Bayesian classification scheme. In that way, we develop the classifier. So that classifier, actually, we developed two types of classifiers. One is for vegetation detection. So you see all the red and the green. They combine together, give you the vegetation detection. And then for that very central area, of the corn plant, we call it rural area. Then we have another classifier that would um, detect the, the, the small difference in terms of the greenness in the center area. So that would allow us to find the center location of each individual 
corn plant seedlings. So once you have that classification scheme developed, then you can essentially split those interconnected corn plant seedlings, uh, which was very difficult in the beginning. So, so then you would be able to get the population and also the spacing, interplant spacing in a row. All right, and then further, you could also establish the crop row profile by doing the regression. So we developed something we call the robust statistics-based uh, regression method. And then once we put every piece together, then you would be able to identify the position of each corn plant seedling in the mosaic image. So something like that. So this is the software interface we developed. And as you can tell here in the upper left window, then that would allow you to generate the classifier um, by mosaic in different parts of the crop row. Because sometimes we have those kind of uh, background objects like sticks, stones, and the residues. They also give you very complex colors sometimes. So if we include them in the process of the training of your classifier, then your classifier becomes more um, robust to those kind of interference. So this, uh, this 2D counter-based um, crop stand uh, detection system worked pretty well when the crop seedlings are smaller. Like for corn plants, the system will work very ideally for V2 and V3 stages. But once they are growing bigger, it becomes very difficult. As you can imagine, then they have the canopy interference, and sometimes the wind would blow the leaf and cover the central rural area, then I don't really have that feature anymore in the picture. So I told the group, the industrial group who was using the system, that you have to use this system when the plants are small. Okay. And still, we cannot handle the outdoor lighting condition very well. So the sensing system has to be covered by a shroud. So we make some cover so the camera actually is hidden inside of the structure there. And that creates some kind of um, inconvenience to kind of set it up in the field. So when we talk about the Recognition. So far, I really just talk about how we detect the corn plants. And there is also uh, one piece of the um, algorithm we developed, which can differentiate uh, grass and the broadleaf type of weeds. So basically what we did was to use the texture. So we look at really kind of at the canopy level, not individual leaf level. Look at the overall appearance of broadleaf grass or broadleaf weeds and the grass type of weeds. And then what we, the approach we took was to develop something we call a filter bank that would capture the frequency signal um, of the broadleaf weeds, the canopy, and the grass. Because you, as you can imagine, broadleaf, they have rounded type of shape, rounded type of uh, leaves, and then grass, they have elongated shape. So if you do the profile across um, a certain region, then you would capture how the intensity level for example changes along the profile. So for the grass, you would have a much higher frequency in terms of the change because you run across the edges much more frequently than broadleaf type of weight. So <clears throat> the third system I want to kind of talk about a little bit here is then the three-dimensional approach. And especially to use stereo vision based uh, corn plant recognition <coughs> approach. And this, on this slide, you can see those stereo cameras. So you can buy them off the shelf. And they also called um, stereo on a chip. So the algorithm actually is hardware-rised. And 
it runs just as conventional camera, and but you get the distance or disparity image um, automatically without any calculation load on your computer. But then with this kind of standard off-the-shelf stereo camera head, what we can obtain is this type of distance image. And they are better than none, but you can tell there are lots of noise embedded into this kind of distance map. And that was one of the challenges to work with this type of kind of poor quality um, distance image. You see also lots of regions you even don't have any data. And why that's the case? Because the standard stereo algorithm is looking at the correspondence matching. And that matching is so much depending on the texture of the surface you are matching. As we can tell, vegetation within the leaves, usually their texture, as you can tell, they are not strong. Especially when you look at them from certain distance, they appear just like a surface. So then that conventional standard stereo vision algorithm often fail very poorly, especially for the regions within the leaf. And it has better success around the edges. <clears throat> and this another sensor we used, it even it has a color channel as well. So it's a stereo with color. Um, my, my student, they didn't really like this camera, but primarily because of the noisy signal. Um, but still, we try to use this kind of off-the-shelf stereo camera to develop our algorithm, again, for the corn plant recognition. Um, so this is the one example in case we have three corn plant seedlings, and they are kind of close to each other, and you have very complex interaction of the leaves among those three seedlings. So when, how can we identify there are three plants? So that becomes a challenge. And also to know the stem location of each plant. So we went on to kind of process the image, try to take out the noise, and then put some kind of remedy to repair the signal. And then <clears throat> trying to find all the, we call the sections, in this, we call the skeleton profile of the, you know, top of yield crop plant canopy, and then we later on tried to merge them into different plants. So what we did then was to look at the the overall structure of the canopy of the corn plant because they all converge, the leaves they converge this to the stem, right? So we use that feature to develop our algorithm. Then we trace each section, and then we run some kind of recursive algorithm to merge them together. And we succeeded, and we found those three stem locations. But as you can tell, it's quite a process. And to put this kind of algorithm in real time, it, yeah, it's not trivial. And it would substantially probably slow down your robot in real situation. <clears throat> but the three-dimensional approach does offer one very important and unique dimension, that's the height. Okay? Um, so often, if you look at the difference between your crop and weeds, you see the number one difference is the height. So the, usually the crops, they, they establish much earlier than weeds. And that's something with a two-dimensional approach we cannot get. Okay. But the lighting condition remains as a challenge. So whenever we are working with a color under outdoor lighting condition, how you can get a good color or have good we call the fidelity of color in that's a challenge unless you, the light is diffused like cloudy day, or you use certain kind of cover to block the direct sunlight. Because often we may have this, we call the shadows, and also this specular reflection, and that would, uh, would uh, basically kind of fade, fade away the color. 
And without good color, then your segmentation may just go wrong. So you want to be able to find the objects from the background. So I kind of had permission to introduce the work from um, the colleagues in Israel. And they did some really kind of, I think, very creative work to try to fix this problem in outdoor lighting condition issue and also the lack of texture issue of the vegetation. So they are developing their customized uh, stereo vision algorithm, particularly for vegetation or for plants. So I want to show you some of their results. And so they gave this example here. You have very dramatic contrast between this very dark shadow area, which you don't really see very well about the color, right? And also this very shiny surface under direct sunlight. If we do a simple excessive grain, then often we are going to miss lots of areas after the segmentation. So we, we lost many parts of the plants. And they, through the transformation, they call this, this is called hue invariant transformation. The RGB color is, space is mapped to this, um, we call it XY, uh, chromaticity color space. And so through that mapping, then the, you can, we can de de develop an algorithm that can overcome the illumination uh, influence. You see, all the data points after transformation, they are congregated along this axis. Okay. And this axis does give you something called a surface dependence there. So I don't really know exactly the detail about how they did this. But as you can tell here, then you would expect more reliable segmentation after this transformation. So then they provide this comparison between the conventional ex excessive grain and uh, hue invariant transformation-based segmentation. So you see the difference between here and there. So the, all the lost pieces within the leaf were recovered. And also the leaf that was um, in the shadow, previously lost in the excessive green approach, now appeared. So with that inherence, which means you have good color recovery or detection. And then they further went on to develop a stereo vision algorithm, which is utilizing the hue information and also to look at the, how smooth the matching is along uh, they call it scan line. So they developed their own criteria to find a good correspondence, which is different than conventional ones. Conventional ones basically look at the, for the, the normalized correlation. And, but they have two criteria. One is local criteria, and another one is called global criteria. So with this combination of different criteria, they produce some very kind of, I think, elegant results in using a stereo vision approach to generate the distance image of uh, plants. So personally, I really um, like this approach. I think that's the way to go that would potentially bring new promises of this um, very you know, classical system, stereo vision system, into the utilization for vegetation and the plant sensing. So I want to move further on um, to our other techniques we used. And this one, kind of very short um, presentation about, we call it active stereo. So there are techniques where you can cast, we call it cast uh, um, light patterns onto the object. For example, this one is um, actually color mapped three dimensional picture of an ornamental uh, plant by using the fringe pattern. But this, actually this picture was reconstructed from 16 pictures. Okay, so 
It has a very refined detail, as you can tell. But it takes time and it takes lots of calculation to come to that kind of uh, the resolution of the distance data. But potentially, it can be a good, can be a very good uh, technology that can be used for phenotyping in greenhouse. And nowadays, we also know um, the um, Kinect, that 3D type of sensor we use in a gaming machine, gaming console. And there are lots of robotics that are using this type of sensor to do the environment mapping, uh, mostly for indoor environment. Um, but actually, this type of sensor, like the Kinect, cannot be really used outdoor. Okay? Indoor is, is OK. Outdoor, they cannot handle the sunlight. So in my group, we used the similar sensor. It's called Time of Flight of Light 3D camera. And so the version we use, this one is from PMD in Germany. Um, it has much more powerful uh, light source that would have certain degree of um, uh, robustness under natural lighting conditions. So we use that sensor to develop the same to develop a solution for the same application. But this time we look at the crop row from the side. So last time I said when the corn plants are bigger than V3, it's kind of very difficult to identify them from the top because of the interference okay, between leaves from different plants. But when you look at from the side, it's a very different world. So that also give us um, something to think about. Where are you going to put your sensor? On top or on the side? And then we develop the algorithms based on, the, again, the stitching mechanism. But this time, the stitching is very different. Because now, you are now stitching the pictures by using the soil background. Okay, We you don't have a soil background anymore. You look from the side. So then we use the features try to match the features from one picture to the next, and then we kind of mosaic them together. And also try to utilize multiple views, because when you are moving along the crop row, you see that the sensor would see the same object multiple times. But sometimes one angle is better than another. Because, for example, corn plant it has leaves extending. Sometimes that leaf would just block your sensor at that particular angle. But when you move a little bit further away, then you would have a much better view. So we also try to utilize that multiple view um, data and try to figure out which view actually give us the best result. And we also use the same sensor to look, look at the cotton plants and try to get their population. And cotton plants, as you can tell, they have very different structure than corn plants. And they have round leaves, very thin stem, and they have much denser um, population. So again, with that 3D data, there is new opportunity we can develop in, in a very um, novel algorithms to extract the stem location. So I don't think I can go into the detail, but I want to show you a couple of slides there. And so we did the, we called the Vesonius mayor and then the curvy linear mayor, and then we further round the half lines that's an algorithm to connect the dots and then to basically kind of recover the stems. So it's quite a bit of process, but again, it's, it's feasible with the 3D data. <coughs> Sorry. And also, when we are using that 3D camera, that camera has a very so, uh, some unique, uh, a unique feature. It offers something we call amplitude image. So the amplitude image is now therefore any conventional two-dimensional camera. For this time of flight of light camera, because it has own, its own laser light source, so that laser light source is emitting uh, 850 nanometer um, uh, wavelengths laser light. So that, once that laser light hits the target, it's going to reflect. So that strength of like, reflection is then measured 
and then saved into an image called amplitude image. So that amplitude image um, becomes very handy when we are working with, with the field situation under natural lighting condition, especially when you have direct sunlight and the shadow. So if we use a conventional camera, we cannot do the mosaicing under shadow when there is a shadow because you don't have kind of consistency across the images. But if we move on to use the amplitude image, the shadow or the shiny spot, they, they vanished. Okay. So the picture is based on the reflectance. So in that way, you do have the consistency of your images sequentially when you're moving ahead. So that would allow us to go back to use the approach to do the mosaicing, but now without using that cover. So which means you could have that sensor mounted in front of your robot without putting an umbrella in above it. Okay. So I think that's a very good feature to have. And so this is a kind of short video to show you the algorithm about using side of view images uh, generated by the three-dimensional time of flight camera. We're almost 100% right with this kind of situation. It's still not fast enough, even though we are using the quad-core CPU, because there are lots of processing going on and to, do the, uh, to analyze the picture frame by frame. So some of the results to show you how accurate we have reached by using this system. And so we could um, measure the interplant spacing with several centimeters um, accuracy. You know, the population detection usually, as you can tell, is about 98% in terms of population. So pretty much we are running into the last section of my presentation. I want to show you some of our recent uh, development of using the time of flight camera um, for the detection of vegetable plants in the field. So here I have some pictures we took last year. Um, so the, for this one it's broccoli, then this is squash. Under, both under very heavy um, weight pressure, because I told you we didn't control weights at all, but because we want to challenge our algorithm. And uh, we didn't really also take easy approach. As you can tell, if you use a color image, maybe you can have a good success because the broccoli looks quite different in terms of color. But that's not what we are intending to do. We are trying to develop more, we call it universal approach, by using three-dimensional point, point of cloud data. So we want to use the shape of the plant in three-dimensional three three space. If we have something established, then we think we can adapt the similar approach to different species. Yes, different species would uh, come up with the required different um, model, because they have different appearance. But similar algorithm can be applied. <coughs> So this is soybean, oh, this is corn and then soybean. As you can tell, corn probably is easier because it's much higher than the rest of the weeds. But the weeds, the, what kind of weed species do we put there? We, we manually sowed the weed seeds there. Um, and rye grass, I think. Grass. Yeah, kind of that. In, so this is soybean, and you see there are many other weeds together with it. So my student is right now working on solutions to detect those crop, speed, crop plants from the background. Weeds, grass, you know, soil. So with the availability of the three-dimensional three data, then we have really <coughs> a very different world to work with. We can look at the subtlety of the surface in three-dimensional space, okay? We can look at how they curve in, curve out, and what's kind of layout of their shape in 3D space, and what's the overall 
presentation of the leaves as the plant as a whole. Okay? So they have maybe have a symmetric symmetric feature, or they may have a number of leaves they oriented in that particular pattern. So all those kind of pattern can be incorporated into our algorithm. <clears throat> but also, as you can tell, we haven't really done that much in that area yet. So I, I think what we are trying to do here is, in my understanding, uh, most of the algorithms are, could be creative for this particular purpose, you know, recognize plants. <clears throat> So we look at the curvature, we look at the gradient, and without 3D space, it's, uh, gradient is different. But now we look at the gradient in the three-dimensional space. Um, segmentation, and we also utilize the amplitude image, as I mentioned before, that's the strength of the reflectance under that, um, the illumination of the laser light. So that reflectance actually have a very good um, clue for segmentation because, especially for between soil and the vegetation. So usually soil, they don't have strong reflectance under that wavelength. So you can have immediate effect to see the difference in terms of the reflectance strength. So here is the example. So we have a broccoli and then you have a bunch of weeds around it and then this is the depth image, and then with this the amplitude image. So now we are trying to develop different um, um, pieces of the algorithm so that would allow us to extract different type of features. So we said curvature, gradient, and uh, the strength of the reflectance. And then we kind of merge them together to create a classifier and that would allow us to segment the um, broccoli plant from the background. And then another example is to show soybean. And it's similar like um, what we did for the broccoli, but the soybean has its own uniqueness, okay? It has its, the leaf looks very different than broccoli. So we want to utilize that different feature and then really build that into our algorithm. But to do that, we do the similar type of um, feature extraction, look at the gradient curvature, and, um, and then try to then bring them together into our classification. So as you can tell with this kind of image, how, how can you figure out each leaf of soybean and then kind of know, okay, they are part of the plant. They are not from the weeds. So that's, in my view, it's a, very challenging task to accomplish, uh, given this kind of image. So we gone through the series of process, look at the, for the normal direction of small pieces of area, and then look at the continuity in the 3D space in terms of the normal direction, and then try to merge them together to recover the leaves. It's not perfect yet, but as you can tell, we, 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 so far we have had quite good success at this stage to extract those leaves. And right now we are also using this newer version of this uh, time of flight camera, time of flight of light camera. Um, it's called uh, PMD Nano. It's rather small, just like that kind of size. And, and this camera has a, has a shorter range, but it allows, also allows you to place the camera close to the plant. In the previous one I showed you, you have to let the camera like 30 centimeter uh, or 15 inch away from the plant. So this one you can put that more closer to the plant and then you can do multiple views. And so we are right now in the stage of examining this camera for our application. So this is another image to show you the, the images captured by this camera. And you can also uh, customize the camera by putting on higher power um, lay, uh, LED, so that would give you a better range and also work, works better under sunlight. So with all the 
nice things I kind of really talk about or praised about of this new 3D sensor. And I think it can offer really lots of potentials, not only in the field, but also in the greenhouse, like for phenotyping. And so we did some work also in our lab to have this simple platform, then you would rotate your crop here, and then your camera is placed there, and then that would allow you to look at the plant from multiple angles when the plant is rotating. And so then in that way, you can actually create something we call more or less like a hologram of a plant. So then you could then extract really multi-dimensional features of the plant. You can go detail for each leaf and how big they are and all the overall mass of the plant. You can probably produce a very good uh, model to get these this kind of measurements. So that really um, kind of finished my presentation. Um, I think we can really think about what are the opportunities and what are the still uh, remaining challenges. I didn't really summarize here, but I think if you reflect from some of the applications we have gone through, yeah, it has, uh, it has so much to do with what kind of sensor you are using. And uh, yeah, the better sensor, of course, they would have a better chance to develop a better system and with, with more complicated um, functionality. Uh, for example, like this robot, we could make this robot to follow a trajectory instead, instead of just simply in and out operation, okay? Um, so <laughs> that probably comes to the system design. When you want to develop a system, then you need to bring so many elements into your decision-making process. Um, so sensing system, of course, is a very critical component in robotics. Um, so I, yeah, I'm open for any questions and discussion. And thank you, it's a quite a long presentation. Okay, we do have uh, some time for questions and hopefully maybe some of you have some. Uh, if you do, let me know because I'd like to get it on the microphone so people can hear online. So if you have a question, raise your hand. One thing I was, you know, I, I was thinking as you were finishing up, um, and you started with a simple uh, example of weed control, and then we, s you got to the point where it's it's somewhat complicated, and the thing that I was referring to, I'm a weed person, so I am familiar with the different techniques, and and we have different chemicals for controlling weeds. And some of these chemicals are selective in their ability to control weeds. And in our, in our normal operation, they're sprayed on and their selective uh, technique works on the, the weeds that are, they're specific to. And in a sense, we're kind of doing that with our automation, if you will. We're, we're um, changing that chemical selectivity into a visual selectivity and figuring out how to, uh, to, to control the weeds uh, using this automated selectivity, if you will. And so it's really kind of a challenge to um, parse out what, we, what a chemical does into what a mechanical uh, operation would look like. And, so, and, and getting really uh, I guess uh, detailed in breaking that apart. Uh, so I was I, I was really interested to see that kind of analogy uh, with with a, a technique that we are already using, and now developing this kind of new technology to really uh, <coughs> kind of split hairs, if you will. But that was something that I was just kind of hit me when I was thinking about it, and I don't know, you know. Um, if we can get back to the, the, the really simple uh, uh, modes of, of um, controlling weeds, or you know, are we going to have to uh, keep getting more complex with the technology that we're using? But as we develop this technology, uh, does that help us uh, address this this more you know complex, uh, I guess, approach? So I, I don't know if I asked a question or made a statement, but... Um, you did both. <laughs> <I think. laughs> so. um, yeah, 
in my presentation, I think my anchor point was the mechanical approach. And if we kind of think about it, what do you comment on? If we want to use uh, selective chemicals, and then that really re probably requires us to know the species. And you know, those herbicides, they are selective to different weed species. And that, certainly that would put lots of challenges to the system. I still think recalculizing weed species in the field condition on the go is primarily very, very challenging task to accomplish in the near future. And you can think about maybe the leaf slap presentation. They have to have very nice arrangements, you know, take a leaf, put it on the board, and then take a picture, high resolution, and then, you know, analyze it. Think about how can you do that in the field. And you cannot slow down and then think a lot and then move a little bit further. So I think the real-time recognition of which species is probably the highest level of the challenge of in terms of recognition. It's very complicated. And that's why I kind of take one step back. How about I just recognize the plants? And then I also say, okay, how about I take mechanical approach? Or we take um, the chemical, chemical approach but non-selective. And so then I really don't care about the weed species, which I think is really difficult. We, are, we have so many of them. Uh, they are all different. Um, but if you look at the crops, they are in a relatively small category. Uh, we could possibly develop good models, good algorithms for those very common crops, like broccoli, soybean, corn. And they, are, they can be better standardized in terms of the algorithm. And so I, I would like to leave the species recognition in real field, real time condition at the end. <laughs> I, yeah, that's my take. We're working towards that. I yeah, guess. that's our probably ultimate goal. Great presentation. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. So the, you mentioned the potential for phenotyping. Is this sort of the basis for the Lemnotech phenotyping system that they have? And this kind of second question is this idea of recognizing plants on the go. Do you ever envision on the go not just plant recognition, but taking it a step further and looking at surface details to detect uh, certain types of stresses or diseases, you know, for scouting applications? Because a lot of scouting is done, you know, through visual identification mm -hmm. and reporting. Because that, that's a huge industry. Yeah. So. Uh, so I think there are two parts of your, um, or your, your comments or question. The first about the Lima Tech technology, I, I think I know a little bit about that company and their technology. And they are doing things so far mostly in greenhouse, but I know they are also moving to the field conditions. Yeah, and they have gantry system there. That's what I heard, and that can allow you to take pictures in the field. Um, for the greenhouse part of the screening, they do use various sensors, and uh, I don't really want to comment. They have their website. And also, I think there's something going on on campus with them. Um, so what, what I'm trying to, some of the examples I gave in my presentation at the end, I said phenotyping, and also actually like our, uh, in the field like crop uh, reconstruction and then each individual plant identification and our side view, those, those data can be used for the plant breeding. And actually we are doing that right now under a USDA project by using robot to do um, uh, in-field, um, high-throughput um, phenotyping. Um, so that, well, I'm working on that project right now. Some of the, like the last one I showed you, the hologram thing, um, I think with this time of flight type of camera, it becomes very handy to allow you to quickly generate the hologram. I mean, I only use the one camera. Think about it, if you use multiple of those cameras, then they, they are there right away. Um, it's much better than using two-dimensional camera. I think that's what I heard uh, that Slimatek is using right now. Maybe they have a new technology now as well. Um, so yeah, if you have better quality of data, of course, you can expect you would have more trustworthy data for your genetic program. Um, and the second part is the... Was the idea of capturing more surface details? So you can detect, like, yeah. 
Exactly. So for, for crop scouting, you don't have to, I think, have to do things on the go. You could do the samples. And you could define, define where you want to get the sample, maybe some kind of scheduling of the you know, dynamic sampling scheme. And so you can stop and take picture or take the spectral things in data. And then you can take time. You can do the post-processing even. Okay, the time constraint is not there, and that's, that's a very hard constraint for like a weeding robot. You have to let it go and then make decision right away. Yeah, that's why we still don't have very good one, in my view, about uh, weeding robot in application. So I, I've got a question along those lines. Is it, so, so it seems like the, the time issue for making decisions, a lot of that's really based on computing speed and computing time. Yes. So what if, what if one went in another direction and took lower resolution images mm -hmm. that could be processed faster? You'd mm -hmm. have less information, but perhaps you can get to a decision more quickly. Is, is that a... Yes, yeah, certainly, and I, I like this because, like, if you look at look at the uh, TOF camera I used, their resolution is much much lower. You are thinking about 200 by 200 pixels, and the the Nano version is only 140 by 160 something pixels. So it's a very small picture, and it give you the depth data. And I think it has tremendous potential to use for real time application. That's that's my take, and I'm really in favor of that, and that's why. In my group, yeah, we have several of them, yeah, and we are using right now. And, yeah, and also like the laser uh, sensor approach. If we talk about like field crop, um, so okay, now for corn plants, for example, we really don't have very good means to control weeds in the crop row, unless we spray. Right? Yeah, we really don't have any good means to do it. But if we eventually want to do um, maybe not perfect, but if we can control a mechanism that can get in between the plants and get out, but very quickly, I think that system I present at the, in the very first by using laser sensors has a very good potential. It's not going to go around the crumb plant, but it's going to come in and come out. So that would allow you to take the majority of the weights away in the crop row. And that sensor reacts fast and it works under any lighting condition. And it's easy to implement. <laughs> yeah, so there are lots of advantages by using simple stuff, but you do have limitation. Mm -hmm. Got a question over here. Ali, I came in late. You know, I apologize because uh, I know you are busy. We're doing a little uh, little classwork today. Uh, I got a couple of questions. Uh, I came in late. Is this uh, camera based on parallax? Or is it, I mean, how are you getting your th a two, 3D? Is that a parallax type thing, or, or is it I, something else? No, I, I think it's based on the, um, the face detection of modulated light. Oh, OK. OK, OK. okay. And, and in reality, what you have to do is actually, if you want to get a full uh, virtual reality of the thing, you actually have to say, quote, unquote, rotate the target or something to get all the sides. Yeah, 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 because you only see one side of the object. Well, the second one, I, I'm, I'm always very fascinated with uh, VRML type stuff like that, and you saw some of that earlier. Uh, has anybody really been thinking a little bit about uh, the plant with regard, and this goes back to actually some of Steve's comment about chemicals, and, and back in the 90s, uh, we talked about this as well a little bit, is how much chemical do you need to bathe this plant, say, either with aerosol and how this might be related to the, say, the boundary area of your target. Mm -hmm. uh, has anybody really looked at any of this in the literature? Or, yeah, you know? I think, uh, personally, I saw some publications. I think there was one paper done by a group in Denmark. They use um, kind of high concentration glyphosate and they apply as a drop or something to individual seedling, and then you know, they observe the effectiveness of that low dosage. And um, yeah, they claim that you can save lots of uh, chemical if you can apply them in a kind of precision fashion, and you don't have to spray a lot. Because this kind of chemical is systematic, right? So it's getting in there, it's getting into the plant, and then kill it. Um, but personally, I haven't done anything in that area, but I, yeah. 
So, so yeah, I once talked with uh, one company, chemical company. Um, they said, oh, Leah, if you can develop a system that can recognize plants, you know, crop plants from the rest of weeds, that's huge. Because then they can use long selective chemical, which they have some very good ones they cannot use. And they are probably low cost and um, maybe not that environmental risky to use. And so. Or you can use lasers. Yeah, <laughs> or you can use lasers. We, we, saw, that, we saw that from Simon's uh, presentation two weeks ago. It, one last question. Uh, is there any uh, research done like testing this like, robotics on a field? Like what was the weed control crop injury? What were the weed pressures, you know, circumstances under which those were tested? And what do you think like about using a GPS guidance for f instead of uh, picture imaging? Uh, does that has any potential to get closer to the row, like GPS technology and guidance? Yeah, I think probably in Simon's presentation he mentioned about that. You, you know, there there are research groups they are using uh, Arctic GPS to map the seeds when they plant them, and then they use that as a reference to guide the follow-up operations. For example, weeding. So they know roughly that seed should be there, and then there should be maybe a crop sitting or you know a, a stand there, and then they have the camera as local sensor that further refine the detection. Um, I don't know how well you can fully rely on GPS without any local detection at this stage. And I think that that effort is still ongoing. They are certainly, yeah, there, there are people working in that area by using GPS to map the crop. Um, and other thing you mentioned about the... Like like robot crop, yes, people are running field experiments to evaluate the yep. product. Yeah, yep. yeah. There's there's efficacy efficacy testing with these um, different uh, automation sensor. Some of the earlier models of uh, these weeder uh, in row weeders um, that's being done. In fact, we're and we're looking at some of the micro rates that uh, are needed for for controlling these small weeds. You know how much chemical or how much how much disturbance do you need to to kill a weed and so we're trying to quantify that because when the technology is there and you know the last question that I would say is are we limited by our resources or are we limited by the current technology that's available I mean When you see resources, you mean what? Well, so if you had all the funding that you needed, <laughs> you're an engineer, right? <laughs> so, en engi so engineers, I've heard it said that if they had, the, they can build anything if they have enough money. So if if the <laughs> <laughs> maybe that, that's, that's that. That's probably yes. <laughs> but 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 is is that uh, you know if if we're seeing the technology now that we can sense plants in the field and we can uh, ascertain somewhat these differences, and we have the computing power to, to start to do that, is, is that, uh, is the technology the limit, or is, is the technology out there and it just hasn't been applied to agriculture because of <coughs> resources that we don't have access to? I probably can sense why you ask this question, because we, <laughs> We had quite a bit, you know, discussion about this through, especially through some of the proposal work. Yeah, we definitely, you know, desperately need some more funding in this area to do research, um, and that would, yeah, be very helpful. And on the other side, um, the technology, I think we have much, much better potential now in terms of the technology advancement and uh, better sensors, you know, high power computational devices and uh, embedded systems we can develop. And, um, but yeah, we need to have two things to work together. We need to have people put on this type of work and, and then to develop a good solution. Um, that requires funding. And 
And also, yeah, I think for agricultural engineers, we develop solutions. Sometimes people say, you need to develop solution with reasonable low cost. Otherwise, farmers probably won't buy it. And because we are now dealing with typically high donor commodity, you know. And so the pro cost of your technology has to be somehow reasonable. That also, I think, is part of the constraint. You can use very good sensors, but then at the end, who is going to use it? And the people have to yeah, evaluate the technology based on yeah, if it's going to give them a better profits you know, at the end. OK, well, I will end. And let's give Lee a hand, and we'll say thank you. Thank you.